Great, so welcome back everybody. And I'm very pleased on the final day of our leadership course to uh, have Claire Farrell, who's the co-founder of Extinction Rebellion and who um, is one of the coordinators for the media and messaging group, as well as um, being involved in a number of the other circles and however else XR organizes itself. Um, we'll probably hear about that. Extinction Rebellion is one of the most interesting bits of the contemporary Western environmental movement, and it's also gone global. Um, it's interesting times for XR, which um, hopefully you're going to all be asking about. Um, and Claire did the course, this course, last year in person, um, so knows what you've been doing, more or less, um, if she can remember. Um, that'd be interesting to find out as well. So the way we're going to do this is um, I'm just literally going to say, please ask questions. And if you ask questions, you know, try and connect it back to our themes of the course. So critical perspectives on leadership, on change, on sustainability, on collapse, on deep adaptation, um, ways of organizing, ways of relating, um, group dynamics, and all the kind of themes that um, self-censorship in the way we show up in the world, all that sort of stuff. So, um, Claire, do you want to say hello to everyone first? Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Um, I guess I don't need to say very much. Um, if you've watched the, the lecture, you've had a bit of an int introduction to, to me, so you know a little bit about me. Um, so, yeah, I'm happy to just take some questions. Yeah, I suppose I should say that you're also um, you're a university lecturer at Central St. Martins and you're in the, the fashion world. Um, um, and you were in XR before it started, as it were, you know, doing all these interesting nonviolent direct actions with Roger Gale and others. So who wants to uh, just go for it, Un unmute and ask a question for, for Claire, please. Helena seems to have unmuted first. Sure. Um, yeah, hello, Claire. I saw you at Meaning last year and you were amazing. So great to see you here again today. Um, I wonder at some point whether you'd say something about anger um, um, as a, a form of, well, actually anger is a form of love. Um, because one of the really interesting things about XR is how you combine love and rage. So I'd be really interested to hear what you say about those two words together, and particularly how uh, forms of anger can be a really useful fuel for action. Um, and then how we might start to talk about anger as a useful fuel for action with um, regular folks, I suppose. Um, how we might introduce that as a as a form of galvanizing something so yeah anger anger and love its use and how we might use it to galvanize action something something like that yeah cool thanks um mm. well i guess it's quite interesting because i was talking about this just a little while back a little bit before the lockdown happened somebody from an art gallery um like a sort of a friend of a friend i guess was putting on a show and they asked if we could talk about from the art department about about anger um, as an emotion. And because um, at the beginning of XR, I wasn't in the media and messaging team. I still think that sounds a bit weird that I'm in that space because I really I really like founded the creative kind of team in the art department. And we worked on the the identity and all the look and feel stuff. So I really sort of um, I, I really still think of myself as being in that in that space as well as um, as well as now sort of like leaning into other parts. But um, these people asked us to talk about anger and they had all these different practitioners and artists go there to talk about it. And, um, and myself and my friends, Charlie and Clive, who made um, a lot of the graphic assets, they sat with me in their office and we made a little video on uh, how we feel about being angry. Um, and it was really, it was really, really nice thing to explore actually, because we talked about exactly what you've sort of alluded to that like when you love someone you can be really really fucking angry with them <laughs> and uh, and that that and the, and the way that those two things are kind of enmeshed feels to me really important um i also think there's something personally there's something interesting for me about the the requirement of anger to be able to like take peaceful action um because uh 
I think I've got a personally a, a quite an interesting relationship with with anger that I that I find it very challenging to deal with it. Um, I actually find it really really difficult to be angry at a person. <laughs> um, I'm really rubbish at like starting conflicts when things need to be aired. <laughs> um, but I'm apparently quite sort of good at thinking about doing something like going and you know assembling hundreds of people to sit in the road because I'm really angry <laughs> um, and that's um, yeah it's just it's quite interesting because it's a certain type of very laboured manifestation of being furious but um, but it doesn't mean at any point that you have to actually face one person and like show your anger to them you know so um yeah there's something kind of like uh that feels like it's a, a i mean obviously it's like a really cathartic piece of work um doing doing a, a rebellion the way that we've done it um and and i guess that's what i'm really worried about actually right now is like the the lack of understanding on my part and many other people i think in xr about how exactly you express that kind of stuff when you can't leave the house um, do you think do you think there's a shadow side to this um welcoming of anger about both the predicament we're in and the crap leadership and what might the shadow side of of recognizing <laughs> and welcoming anger in x r be um, well i don't know i mean it, i i guess you can just find you could potentially find that people are acting things out and perhaps not quite uh, processing things to the next, to the next stage on, you know, um, I guess. And I think the, I think there should be in, we did this really funny experiment with some, in a, in a group session where somebody said, if you were like the dictator of XR, what would you do? And um, and I sat down with this like small group of people that I don't know well at all um, and wrote down, we all had to write our lists of like what would be our list of rules and what would we implement. And, um, and we had some really interesting ideas, but like one of the things that I said <laughs> was uh, that there would be like mandatory therapy, <laughs> individual therapy, <laughs> not like, and then someone said, that's really bad, Claire. You can't force everyone to do the same kind of therapy because everyone wouldn't want to do it. But I was like, I just really want to know that everybody's taking care of something for themselves like that. Do you know what I mean? Because a lot of people in Extinction Rebellion do. And I have to say, I've never, in, that, in the rest of the world out there, I've never experienced so many people who've done so much paying attention to their own shit. It is, it is a movement full of like fantastic people. Um, who, who've done a lot of work, the work as it were, but, um, but yeah, that was, <laughs> that was what I said. <laughs> Thank you. Super, thanks. Uh, this is Joy here, I may have a go. Um, so uh, XR, as I understand it, offers some hope that things may change for the better. And I just wonder how that fits with deep adaptation. Um, and also, how do you lead, lead a devolved organisation? Um, <clears throat> okay, so I'll t well, let me just make a note of that. Um, so, so XR seems to offer hope that things might change for the better to some extent. And how does that fit with deep adaptation? Yeah. Um, and the second one, which was just a sneaky add-on, is how on earth do you lead a devolved organisation? Yeah. Um, Okay, so the hope one is a good question, and um, I like I don't really I don't really think that hope's a particularly interesting thing. Um, and again, that's like quite per I know very well that's quite personal. Like I, I think as a young person, I sort of um, I just found hope to be like the source of a relentless amount of pain. <laughs> um, so uh, so I don't really think it's very cool. Um, um, but <clears throat> I guess the challenge is that like, and this was raised by a friend of mine actually, well, somebody who, Mark, who um, Gem knows, Mark, recently, that when we first launched, we had all this messaging that said like, we're fucked and hope dies, action begins. And 
all of this stuff, which was really about admitting that things weren't looking particularly possible. Uh, however, you, you know, knowing what you know and knowing how fast things could change, there's still like nothing better to do than try to do something. And I don't need to like know that this is going to work to know that it's like the right thing to oppose making it worse. <laughs> so, so that kind of like releasing yourself from like the expectation of like success or a certain outcome and being able to like act anyway from a position of like sort of centering on your own moral compass was really the point and I think as it's become a mass movement a lot of somewhat more hopeful people have entered the scene <laughs> in a way um, and that's what I've noticed as we've grown because it went so big so fast it's been quite hard I think for lots of facets of XR to be able to hold on to what was intended to be embedded in it at the beginning and of course what was embedded from the start was also like flawed but it was just there were quite a lot of things thought about that were nothing to do with me because there were other people who were being really clever thinking, oh, we need to like set up this part and this thing and this thing needs to be thought about. And, and a lot of that was really, really good, but it had its faults. And, and as we've expanded, there are things about the culture that have sort of shifted and changed a little bit. There are things about the messaging that have sort of expanded and people are very concerned about like, scale of the movement and growing the movement and also I, to me that feels like it's constantly in a sort of um it's constantly being sort of like in hanging in a balance with like the question of like will this help get like a million more people maybe if it sounds hopeful is it really telling the truth in the way that I personally would like to perhaps if it's gotten a million people appeal, not. We don't know quite, but it, it, there's a sort of, I feel like there's often a tension between people who want to say, no, look, this is like all of this. <laughs> you just, you just watch the talk. You know that it's really, really bad. Don't go out and say, we've got 12 years to fight climate change. You know what I mean? I mean, when people put that banner out, they say we've got 11 years or whatever. I mean, I just, you know, I, I could have, I don't, <laughs> I've got no words really like there's no there's no consent from me for like that kind of messaging but so it sounds it sounds like earlier on you were a bit closer to deep adaptations idea of that things are going to unravel um, but as XR became huge then some of that edge was smoothed off so where are you at now in that in that dilemma then are you uh, is XR going to be more clear about, um, because the implication, if the truth is that it's too late to stop a catastrophe and this society will unravel, then, then adaptation, whether, whether or not deep, you know, adaptation is, is something to have in the conversation as much as going net zero. Where are you at with that? Well, at the moment, I'm trying to form some revised kind of short statements that can go uh, through the messaging teams, through the media teams, as like guidance for things that they do and don't say. For example, people put out something about a campaign against bailouts recently and they didn't say anything about participatory democracy. They didn't say anything about assemblies. They didn't say anything about like the political reality of why those decisions are being made. They just said no bailouts which is fine, like we should be saying no bailouts, but a lot of other people are gonna be saying that. Point is like, we have a political system that is like owned by vested interests. That's why we want real people to be involved in politics. That's why we want a citizens assembly and whether things collapse fast or not fast, I definitely wanna see that structural political change. And it seems to me, that now the alarm has been rung last year, we really don't need to hammer on about the science in quite the same way. Like everyone's heard the alarm, like the public are shitting themselves, whether they're like paying attention or like running away from it. It's 
it's like in people's heads I don't think it's like a question it's not an argument we have to win anymore when we started we were very much saying like when your paper came Jen like if you look at this 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 and this all together then you can tell that we're totally fucked but how come nobody's saying it because the people from NASA write this paper because the people from this place write this paper for the people from this place write this paper the biodiversity people write this paper but nobody was putting it all in one home and saying if all of these things are real then like really that's collective like awful situation and it, and it felt like last year was really like getting an alarm to go off which actually has has happened <laughs> and the youth strikes added to the volume of that and XR added to the volume of that and now I feel like it, it, yes we probably do need to think about how we speak about the adaptation and, and, and the potential collapse narratives but I actually also think that XR needs to like focus down on like the nature of getting like political change as well yeah, out, of the, yeah. out of the demands it seems to me that's always been the most important one um, mm -hmm. yeah that's interesting because it came up in our conversation last night about um, maybe we don't even need to talk about our um, expectation of collapse. We can actually talk about because that's how we see things, then what's important. And then we can talk about what we think is important rather than necessarily having to bang on about collapse. So yeah. that's interesting there. The sort of parallels of what you're saying. Second part of the question from Joy was um, leading a decentralized or distribute was it decentralized organization yeah devolved devolved organization there we go that's the answer there we are very good <laughs> um it's really challenging it's really really challenging i mean i i i appreciate that i'm in some like position of leadership um but also I think what's I think what's been a shame about XR has been that like some of the people who take leadership roles on don't really get appreciated for them. They get scrutinized for them. So then it looks like quite a shit place to be. So I think probably then less people think, oh yeah, I'll step up and <laughs> I'll step up and lead a team. Um, because I kind of think that I can. I mean, I got like elected into my new role, which I've told Gem about, like by the team that was in a you know it had grown and it was like uh, it hadn't been managed well it was too big it was quite messy and I got elected to go in and do that role and I do feel like a sort of stereotypical reluctant leader in that way that like I definitely didn't want this role <laughs> when people said yeah you're in that team I'm so happy I was like I'm fucking not <laughs> because it's going to be really difficult and so I guess what's interesting is is that if you don't have any sort of like if you don't have an official kind of um recognition of any of, of any hierarchy and authority in a space right then you end up with a system that like runs on soft power and um in some parts that's kind of what's that's kind of what's happened and it's also interesting to notice that it's kind of I mean, it's no different to the real world, right? But like, if you know everyone, then you can get shit done. And if you don't know everybody, then it's harder. So for some people, they do hold power through just relational knowledge um, and, uh, and, and relationships that they've got with each other. And I'm not very clear kind of how you, how, how, we, deal, how we deal better with that. I mean, we're trying to like work out ways of having uh, buddying systems where you like get people from other circles, maybe from like, uh, local or regional groups that don't have many people in the in the national teams and you bring those people on as like uh, shadow to shadow people to come into like the the national working group structure and come in and work so we're trying to do that we're trying to organize um, socials to get people to uh, connect with each other in, in ways that they haven't so far um, we're trying to reorganize the way that we allocate funds um, because uh, as you, you might know that we've like had some financial problems, we've run out of money, we, we grew very big and, we, and we, our income didn't keep up. So especially with no uh, action on the streets in May, we usually bring in, a, a, most of our money comes from crowdfunding. So most of it would come through us going back out on the streets. So we also know looking ahead that we've got like 
we've got no cash flow now because we're not going to go out. So we're not going to have a rebellion. So we're not have that money coming in. So there's loads of kind of um, stuff about it, which is actually quite ordinary. <laughs> um, and, and then, and then there's something about it, which is kind of, I think it's struggled a little bit with the scale. So when it was quite small, and as it grew like to a, to a mid-size, it felt like it, like it had um, like, a, 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 like a sort of fairly flat, like, but really like tightly linked network of people who kind of all worked together. And then it kind of expanded around the edges. It felt like it made sense when it went around one kind of circle, but I don't, I don't, you probably don't know about our structure, but we've now got kind of three super circles of how we organize which have all got different teams within them. And that system of organization and governance now feels to me quite complex, uh, a little bit too complex. So there can be bit people making big decisions over here that impact people over here, but they don't necessarily have a guaranteed good connection designed in. And I think a lot of the leadership difficulties for me are in like, in, in like information flow basically. Like people can find it easy to come together around like projects or different parts. There's not, so, there's not so much contention about like, oh, we don't want to work on that. Or we don't want to work on that. The problem is getting like the right people to hear about it <laughs> and to know that this like campaign against bailouts is happening. So how do people find that and pile in when they want to work on it? Um, I guess the other thing that's interesting is um, being able to like, as a creative, I've found it quite challenging that the self-organizing system that we use doesn't, it understands inclusion, but it doesn't understand creativity somehow, <laughs> which I think is, you know, when you get like a certain dynamic, that's like a chemistry between, between people that are like really going to work really well together, that's, that's how you make good creative work. It's not, this is gonna sound really dodgy, but like creativity isn't a democratic process. It's, it's a thing that happens and you need to like give it space and you also need to allow people sometimes to choose who they work with. <laughs> uh, if you like include people for the sake of like fairness and put them in a room, they don't they're not gonna make like the most outstanding creative work of all time necessarily unless they're the right people and so I think there's I don't fully understand myself like how how you work with with that knowledge and in and in a way where you where you are not creating like exclusive teams where people are like saying no 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 I'm just working with them because they're because we like each other um so that's a real there's a real rub there I think so I'm um, one of the key things I'm hearing in answer to Joy's question is um you lead it uh, a devolved organization um, quite openly and honestly in terms of all the mess and um, and and accept that there's going to be a bit of a messiness um, and keep rethinking about your processes and, and such like joy of what do you think you've heard there yes it was good it was interesting I um, I've always admired the leadership of, of such a devolved organization it's really interesting to hear from Claire how that works thank you cheers I guess Jen, yeah. the thing from your course last year that was really helpful was thinking that like was was really just sitting still for a minute and thinking about leadership as like a as like a thing that means you have to listen because I'm not really I don't see myself as a leader but I do know that I can listen and so I think that was quite I think that was really really helpful and that I and that I made me go back into the space in XR and think that perhaps when I'm like listening, 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 and sometimes slightly rolling my eyes at someone and thinking, yeah, okay, uh, yeah, I get it. I can't actually fix this, but okay. That actually that like understanding that that is actually really, really helpful and not me just wasting my time listening to people. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, thanks. Like, that's, that, yeah, that's come up. And also <laughs> this morning with the practice we did before you, before you joined us. Um, yeah, Kat. Yeah, I'm really interested in what you were saying about inclusiveness there, um, Claire. So, because one of the things that, that really exercises me is how a lot of marginalised people don't get their voices heard. And some of the projects that I've been involved with have been about not comfortable, privileged, reasonably educated middle class people like me telling their story, but 
giving them the tools, teaching them the crafts and the skills, whatever, to tell some of their story. And um, I, I'm wondering if you've got a perspective on how you lead or one leads, but also one brings leaders out of those marginalized people who may not have the vocabulary of words or even of ideas that are sometimes used in creating the structures of green parties and XR and so on and so forth. Because for me, um, I have, I have found myself disengaged from those groups sometimes on behalf of other people, if you know what I mean. I felt yeah. I get what's going on, but the guy that I'm dealing with, the shelter who's struggling with addiction or wet brain or whatever it might be, or just his literacy is not great. He's gonna to struggle to understand what's going on. He's gonna to struggle to tell you what world he hopes for. And so those voices may not get heard in your process. Yeah, there's yeah, there's a lot in there. Um, I well, firstly, I think if you want to hear what people have to say, and this is probably my criticism of our SOS system, not understanding like creativity, is that if you can find methods and ways to like hold spaces where people are being creative, well, then then that that's what I think I'm sort of saying there is is it would be. Um, it would be nice to see more sort of workshops formats rather than like meetings. We know very well how to have a deliberative decision-making process, but we don't know quite so much how to tease, tease something out of someone creatively, if that makes sense. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think if we're, um, I mean, there's been also, I think a, a, a kind of recognition that sometimes people want to organize with people that are like them which is cool, right? Um, however, if that's your only like premise for like how to welcome people into the space, say that you can make your own space, then you also sort of don't do the cross pollination thing, which is yeah. the challenge. Um, I just, there is a working class group that's, uh, that sort of meets on that basis. And, um, I'm a little overdue to have a call with somebody from there, but I want to work out with them like who, who they think would be um, an interesting rep link to have coming into the media and messaging team um, at, to at least find one. We've found some really excellent like working class spokespeople that we've been working with recently. And so I'm trying to look at like how those people come into the space and what, and what, what people, what people want to say. Um, I'm also working on like sort of trying to heal um, a, a relatively fractured relationship with one of the other working groups, which is um, ISN, Internationalist Solidarity Network, who um, have set up a network of support um, uh, all over the global south. So they've got people in, in South America, in Asia, in Africa, and they're particularly connected with the Pan-African Reparations um, campaign. And um, and, you know, I'm, from speaking to them at, at length, I understand that they've had some significant problems dealing with certain members of, of Extinction Rebellion who've come into, um, who've come into the space um, and have not really, like, connected with what they need to speak about properly. So, yes, they've posted something on social media, but it's not been quite in context, it's not been quite in like, recognition of what it, what it actually says, what they actually want that to come across with. So... Um, so yeah, I'm kind of interested in, in how, how we find increasingly better ways to work with people that like lifts up voices and, and, and helps them to do what they say, what they need to say, if you know what I mean. I think that XR could have been doing that like a lot better for, for a longer time. Uh, if we'd have had different approaches. We've got a few questions um, coming up. Uh, Kevin, Chris and Sam. So um, over to any of either of you. Kevin, I think. Yeah, sorry, I'll just unmute. Um, okay, um, I'm involved with um, with local councils and um, climate emergency declarations, and XR have been brilliant at, at kind of provoking and leading those. Um, and and in the absence of, of leadership from national government, we're we're kind of doing our best to to lead from from the bottom, if you like. But but it's difficult. 
one of the tensions there seems to be with, um, I have some conversations with people in XR, is, is a tension between that kind of provoking, that demonstrating, that, that saying you've got to do something, and actually supporting uh, councils to, to, to actually do these things, to, to have citizens' assemblies and, and, and all of these things. Um, so I'm not quite sure how this fits in with leadership, but it's certainly a question I'd like to um, hear a bit from you about. I, I suppose one of, one of the things that I've noticed in talking to people is that trying to even get a, um, a decision about this just vanishes into a, a, a void. Uh, because of the complex um, decision making structure and I, I'm a member of a co-housing community in Lancaster where you know we, we do all of this stuff and, and I'm well aware of all these devolved leadership issues anyway yeah I don't know what's in all that. <laughs> so you want, are you wanting to ask about how to support getting assemblies mainly? About how XR can support in a positive way rather than just a provocative way yeah yeah just just for context so kevin you you've been involved in this nationwide network of local councils that have um declared climate emergencies and having led that work in lancaster yourself yeah thanks um <clears throat> It's a really good question. I don't actually really feel like I know a very good answer to it, to be honest. I know that people in Bristol have worked really hard to support the kind of local local members of, of, of their council to be able to push through to, to get that Citizens' Assembly agreed that, that they've agreed to be led by on, um, on climate. Um, but I don't actually know what that process looks like in terms of support. I could, if you want to be put in touch with me, I'm happy to try and find one of the people who was involved in it and put them in touch with you if that's helpful. Brilliant. And when you do, let, get, ask them to in, include adaptation in their climate emergency framing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, uh, Sam, you got your hand up and then to Chris and then any, maybe if, if you, any of you know how to use the hand up function, I think if you go down to the bottom, there's uh, reactions. Is that it maybe? Um, let me, yeah, there's a you, clap and a thumbs up is all I can There's a clap and a thumbs up. If you, to, if you go to participants at the bottom, which is next to the little chat, oh, yeah. click on that, and then at the bottom of the list of participants, you can, you can raise your hand. Okay, there we go then. So, uh, wow, we've got hands coming up. So anyway, Sam, then Chris, and then Sonia, and then Dominic. Wow. Oh, we now have now got claps too. I think everyone wants to. Oh, that, wow, everyone wants to ask. Look at this. Kick it off. Like we just hey. discussed emojis. Mm. <laughs> Um, hello, Claire, and thank you very much for being here and for everything that you've done. Um, my question would be about business, and it's in two parts. And I know from doing DNA training and working in my local group that business is not a core focus. But I'm interested in your perspective because you have uh, a great knowledge of it in an overlap within the fashion industry, and that's an industry that's you know, hugely problematic, as with others. So the first part would be, what have you seen that's worked in terms of helping leaders in those industries who do want to make a difference and they find themselves torn because they're not in as dynamic organization as you are and they're on the one hand desperate to do something but also within glacial ancient structures that both give you a myriad of real reasons the word change is difficult and they give you lots of excuses why change is difficult so what have you done there or, or, or have you managed to work there within fashion or others or comparable leaders and secondly is do you do you see a time when XR needs to begin to include business more um, in terms of the, the, the scope of where the pillars of influence are as there's a, an awakening and a, an increasing intention to do something good from that space, but there's very little in, for those leaders to turn to that's going to help them do anything you know, radical and dynamic enough? Um, yeah, good question. Well, there was a thing called XR business once upon a time it caused quite a stir. Um, <laughs> and uh, it got a few people in quite a lot of trouble and then there were there were major apologies had to be made there was a very big kind of um, there was a very big uh, swathe of people I guess across the movement globally as, as well as in the UK who had a kind of immediate allergic reaction to the concept and um, and I think that uh, 
that's for good reason. Um, but I also think that the, that the, the desire to do that work came from a, a, an extremely radical place. Um, and ca just calling something XR business doesn't sound like you're going to do something really radical, I guess. So the, the, <laughs> I don't think there was very much um, exploration and reassurance of like what that would mean. Um, there is a group called Catalyzers that work on, um, oh, they sound quite funny to me, but like some of them <laughs> went to Davos and they've been getting like executives to sit in fire circles and like weep, um, which you know is great i'm like all, all power to them i've got massive respect for people who go and meet those people and hold their hands through that shit because i just couldn't fucking do it um <laughs> give me the anarchists any day um <laughs> but um but no so they're doing that kind of work to try and i guess like penetrate that world and also build trust rights so they go in and say like we're not here to like glue ourselves to your desk but we do want to like make you fall in love with us and then afterwards you'll love XR and it's kind of funny because I feel like it's 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 obvious that that kind of probably does work quite a little quite a little worm goes in and, and then that's it they can't they can't ever like not know that there are ex-business leaders in in Extinction Rebellion that like sat them in a circle and held their hands and um so that work is happening which is kind of interesting <laughs> um <laughs> but um but I guess I mean for me uh from a fashion perspective you know I, the, the system itself is so is so cynical you know it is so cynically set up that I just I have seen people try and do good things in business and feel like there's someone in the way that they can't talk into it or I've seen people like very senior in businesses like implement a project which is basically like a piss in the ocean yeah. just to say that they're doing it and then their workforce has got no connection so that they don't give a shit about it. So they don't really want to do it because it gives them extra work, right? So that's a project I did with Tesco's I'm talking about. It's like, we'll do a green project in the fashion thing, but actually it's just loads of labor for the buyers who don't care, don't see the value, but it's probably just going to go on this list of green projects that gives us like access to certain types of investors who otherwise wouldn't come near us because we don't have enough stuff going on. So the whole thing I think is cynical as fuck. And, um, and, and for that reason, I think, you know, people, activists need to be extremely cautious about how they interact with business, like in the same way that they should be as cautious when they interact with politicians, you know? Um, so, um, so yeah, I think it's very serious. And I don't know if anyone's seen that new Michael Moore film that's caused an absolute stink, um, but I watched it last night and um, like, I kind of think I'd, I haven't had time to reflect on it. And everyone, I, lots of people that I know and love are furious. Um, but I kind of thought it was fair enough, actually. Like it's, cause that is also about business, it's about industry. It's about industry. Can industrial civilization deliver us from industrial civilization? And I think that's a fair question that he's asking, but it's obviously been met with everyone going like, fuck you, don't spoil my dreams, you know? Um, so. I, I just would like to build on the, the, the answer because they're good answers and I have heard them. And I've managed to find my way to the Catalyzer crew and I've heard of them sitting in fire circles. And I, I don't, see, you know, you said it's clear that that's worked, but I haven't seen any evidence that that has worked. And I think that's, so, so it's, I can't deny, I think it's a good thing to do in it's a position of influence, but it, it falls into the, argument that you know capitalism can be the answer to capitalism which i don't i don't buy um and then the other end of it of being very very cautious i think is right because i think there's there'll be so much bollocks and if you give them a chance to look like they've done something then that would be the worst thing we could do thanks then, sam I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of um all these hands up what i'm going to do is because we've got so many hands up and only 20 minutes left um i'm going to ask for th three questions in a batch um so it was Chris, Sonia, and Dominic first. Um, so if you could ask your questions succinctly and then as a batch, and then we can make, make sure we get through everyone. Hi, Claire. Um, I'm Chris, and I am a primary school teacher, and I have worked actually across my school organization with, with uh, secondary students as well. And, um, you know, my, I, I guess I'm, I've been thinking a lot about, uh, you know, school strike for climate, um, and, and how XR is engaging, you know, youth and, and families, um, but also looking at it from a, you know, teacher's perspective, being sort of on the inside and 
having to, in, in a way, sort of be covertly uh, rebelling against this system. Um, and I guess my question really is about how XR is, is building maybe those partnerships with not only with, with youth and families, but also with, with teachers and with, you know, the, 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 I suppose the people who are in uh, a prime position to influence youth, um, you know, yeah. how would you speak to, to, to someone like me in that situation? Thank you. Great, great question. Sonia and, and then Dominic. So my question links a little bit with Kat's question, which was um, to widen it a little bit. Um, I've got a friend who um, is a real kind of disability justice sort of warrior, if you like. Um, and she's taught me a lot about ableism and looking at things from being able-bodied and has been quite critical of XR, sort of closing roads, causing like mayhem for people who are disabled without giving that any thought and using some kind of crude things about being blind and stuff like that, you know, and just feeling like um, the disability voice isn't being heard in that or thought about because it's able-bodied people, again, sort of just seeing it from their worldview. Just wondering about um, the leadership kind of angle of thinking about things from a more diverse perspective. And that kind of goes, you, you touched on it with the South America stuff around of black minority ethnic kind of voices as well and um it, there's been criticism of xr being a bit whitewashed so thank you that's yeah a question great and exactly and uh dominic hi claire um I, my question is I, I i work in a multinational and i've seen some of the control that they try to um exert over them their brand so even just the, the very precise color of red of, that's used for their logo and so on and i guess having been involved in xr edinburgh i can see that it's often asserted you know and anyone can do an action anytime you know feel empowered to just go out and do it under the band of xr and i wonder how how well does that work for you are there issues to do with therefore controlling dilution or, or corruption of the message or, or, or just impact uh, if, if, if anything can happen anywhere under an XR flag. Thank you. Okay, there's your three, Claire. <laughs> okay, uh, relationships with youth, families, teachers, I'll tell you first. Um, so uh, we've got a strong connection with Caroline Hickman who um, I know is focused on that stuff. And we've got XR uh, groups of teachers and XR families. So there are like different, different points of contact with, with that thinking. I would say, um, well, we've got XR youth as well, which is another, which is an, a whole, a whole nother kind of like self-organized youth group. Um, yeah, so I would say that there are many, many parts where this comes through, but it's it's interesting to think about um, about where this fits in the sort of um, where this sits in terms of like the, the the main thrust of messaging of what people talk about, because I think it's um, I think it's striking that within the green movement in general there are people who understand very well that there is, a, there is a necessity to have that conversation about equity. And often that's in reference to um, the global South. Less often it's in reference to like the working poor in the North. And less often it's about intergenerational equity as well. And so I think there's a, there's a lot there which, which often gets like, um, somewhat sort of like reduced um and i think there's been a there's been a lot of people in xr who've been out saying you know in the in the moment of doing their actions who are talking about their children or their grandchildren the grandparents who who wear the the, the pictures of their grandkids around their necks or whatever when they go out and take uh direct action um but in terms of like the relation to teaching, the relation to education and the relation to like what what we think, what do we think would prepare young people for what's coming rather than. Uh, so it's, I guess it's like it's more of an adaptation thing rather than a kind of like, you know, I'm doing this for the kids, the poor kids. We're really worried about them. I feel like the message around youth quite often comes through in, in that in that way, which is a very sort of moralizing message. 
um, about duty or whatever, about, about intergenerational kind of like passing on. We, we do speak to that, but in terms of talking about um, what education does and what it's for now, if we sort of recognize that, that the world is not gonna look like the world we had, um, and, and probably quite soon, then, um, then yeah, I think, that's a, I think that could be like made much more of. And, um, and I think we need people to, to support doing that work because it's, it's at the moment, it's a, a, as I understand it, I, might, I can't keep my finger in all the pies, so I don't quite know what the, what the teachers, XR teachers group is, is looking like, but I think XR educators and teachers is, is, is quite a fairly small space. Um, yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay, ableism and race. Um, yeah, you might have seen the uh, Vice article that came out yesterday or the day before, absolutely um, slamming XR America. Um, so uh, XR US has, has been around for some time and now there's a thing called XR America, which is I don't really know all the details, but there's a group of people who've been unhappy with the way that the US national system has been set up. Uh, so they've set up XR America, um, which uh, doesn't want to say exactly the same things as XR US. And there's been a lot of um, kind of left kind of arguing and fighting kind of fairly typical um, arguments going backwards and forwards. Um, I also have, se have recently been introduced to a guy called Ian Haney Lopez, who's a Latino uh, professor from the States, whose um, work is all about kind of recognizing the need to unite people across race and class lines in order to be able to form a majority enough to, to win, in inverted commas. And for him, it's like a political win. So he's talking about like getting to 60% of the country in solidarity, um, which is really fascinating to me because we've always looked at this sort of like civil resistance model, 3.5% of the population to make big change. His, his view, which is, seems very interesting to me, is like 60% um, in support and in solidarity. So, um, so we're just sort of like exploring that space with him. I'm going to be talking to him where we had some very critical letters from a group called Wretched of the Earth, who you may know. Um, and there's a member of Wretched of the Earth who's going to come hopefully on a live stream with Ian and with Roger Hallam and possibly some other people to discuss uh, his ideas really. And um, and yeah, I think he's. Uh, I think his work is fascinating. The way that the way that he can present the kind of pragmatic case for the necessity of solidarity and compassion in order to be able to like move forwards. Because really, that's the that's the messaging that works the best in his. <clears throat> and he's done it in quite a sort of like uh, method me methodical way to like go and test out the messaging on different political groups of people. So he does. Um, He's, uh, he's very well versed on like issues around race, but he's actually brings it first and foremost from a position of pragmatism and says, look, you, you guys think you're like all having an argument. You don't need to. You could be working together and you would basically immediately win if you could just <laughs> work through this stuff and come together. Um, and on, on the ableism thing, I think the, um, I think the disabled rebels group, um, I mean, I've, I've recently spoke to somebody and recommended that they go and they go and like get, get a stronger connection with them for the actions team. Um, that's not to say that we don't have disabled people involved in, in things, um, but we definitely haven't focused on it enough. And in October, I mean, we did get quite a, a little bit of press around this, which I think was really important, but you know, the police went after the disabled people in October. I don't know if you know that. Um, they took the disabled toilets, they took all the ramps, they took the equipment, everything that was associated with being like hosting people with disability in a public space, which we actually did manage to cater to kind of okay-ish, you know, as a first start in April. We had around the Marble Arch stage, we had disabled port we had some facilities set up to support having people at that, at that space. 
in a in October everything was just lifted by the police and it seemed quite pointed like we're going to make this impossible for disabled people to be here and we know what the police have been like with disabled protesters in the past in the UK and that that really does deserve more um, more recognition from from XR and it and it needs to be a continued um, a continued piece of work totally um, what's the next one brand oh brand this is the easiest question for me obviously um the yeah the yeah i you're at risk when your brand is like able to be just picked up and used by any old person um but i think we've been relatively lucky so far because uh apart from a few fascists making a few stickers there hasn't been there hasn't been as much co-option of it as i might have expected actually um, and uh, we're in the process of doing trademarking the the name and the logo um, which will mean that we've got a sort of like um, a big international brand status in trademarking um, I know some of the sort of like for some of the sort of anarchists it's like well if you need to go to court to do that then that's bad and you should, you're relying on the system that exists and you should make it all creative commons but the problem with that is that people can sell it and what we're really trying to do is stop people from being able to use our use our our um, creative assets and make money out of it because we've never wanted to do that ourselves so for example to make like a piece of XR merchandise you show up in a place and you roll on the ink yourself on the block and you print the thing. So it's an action based thing. You can't buy the t-shirt and not go to the thing. You have to go to the thing to make the t-shirt. And so making, building that into it was really, really intentional for me from the, from the beginning. Um, and I think uh, we're hoping to kind of evolve the brand uh, in a way, sort of get a new font and work on some new um, visual assets. And I think we just have to keep trying to, trying to stay ahead because we've got the rebel burger, the rebel renting schemes, the whatever, you know, so, I mean, it's, uh, the language gets co-opted even if you protect yeah, just it. want to say that that's not XR's rebel burger. That's, yeah. that's Burger King's, is it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, yeah, rebel washing is the new thing. Uh, yeah. Abigail, then Ellie. Uh, hi, Claire, I'm Abigail. So it was a quick question really about narratives, um, I suppose, just in light of what's been happening to us all with COVID, whether and how you see the XR frames and narratives shifting in response to that, particularly given some of the contentious stuff that's been out there about, you know, what does COVID have to do with climate change and, and, and human behaviour? So just be interested to know your thoughts on that. Thanks. Nelly? Hi, I'm interested to know about what you took away from the course in terms of the deep relating and deep connecting practices that you were exposed to and participated in. How have they uh, become part of your work with XR or perhaps not at all? Thank you. Yeah, cool. Um, COVID narrative. Okay, so... Um, well, yeah, I mean, everything's changed, hasn't it? And so it's really difficult in an organisation, well, in a movement, to be able to get everybody to recognise something like that at the same time. I know my friend Ali was trying to get this to land with people, uh, particularly in the messaging team, before I came into the media team. Um, but she was there trying to like get people to go, this is going to change everything. And lots of people were going, yeah, I know, but we've still got to carry on, blah, blah. And she was like, no, <laughs> look, at, look at what's going on in Italy. This is about to change everything. And it's going to like, and it took quite a lot of people different amounts of time to kind of come to terms with it, it felt like in a way. Um, and I count myself in that, it sort of, at a certain point, I wasn't really quite believing that it was going to like decimate the rest of 2020. Um, and then at some point I sort of admitted that it was, but it, we're all on a different kind of time frame. So I think working within like trying to, trying to pull people together around narrative and around framing can be extremely challenging in these kinds of shifting sands times because people are at different stages with it. And I guess in a way it's like, 
seem to me like COVID is like a really, really fast version of climate change. It's like the exponentiality function over like weeks, not decades. And it's everyone going, ah, shit, <laughs> you know, but not at the same time somehow, uh, even though we're all living through it and we feel like we're living the same day to day. Um, so that's been really challenging. And I think, um, and I think in terms of, in terms of bringing forward a new narrative, we were already working on something before this before this really broke, which was like recognizing that we need this new story. And the thing I want to say about that is that a lot of people are going, we need the new story. And like, it's all about the new story. And I got really kind of alarmed at the thought that there was like a handful of people who thought that it was their job to write the story. So, um, so we've we've put together this document which is nearly ready and so those of you who are connected to xr you'll probably see it in the next few weeks but it's called um it's called the impossible book um and it's a kind of an invitation to to be really really ambitious and really expansive and and it, it builds on the idea that kind of xr has always done stuff that like people said was impossible and i'd say like even from the beginning people would say to me like yeah it's impossible you're not just because six of you like went off on one and spray painted City Hall, it doesn't mean you're gonna get like, how are you gonna get 200 people to do that with you? That will never happen. Um, there's been an element of like creating the impossible that's happened already and people are surrounded by it right now with like grounded planes and shut down businesses and all of the stuff that's happening and all of the bailouts that are gonna happen that are gonna seem like impossible things that you couldn't even dream that someone could like sign the fucking check, right? So in the good and the bad sense there's like impossible shit everywhere so that's what we're trying to like open as a space and then from there I, I believe that actually the in, in terms of narrative I think what this could help a lot with the environmental movement is to move it to like talk more about health so like we understand that like everything centers on health and the economy should center on health and our movement should center on health and I think maybe maybe this COVID thing thing is going to help us to help us to do to do that because i i feel like that's going to be the kind of like relevant the relevant thread for people in like having lived through a pandemic mm. thank you and uh, for ellie's question um i don't know maybe we called it authentic relating or uh morning circles i think when you were on the course last year um well we sit in circles anyway in xr so I remember this last year sitting with everybody on the course and saying, talk, people talking about sitting in circle. And I was like, oh, we sit in circle every day, <laughs> pretty much. But, um, but there's something really that I loved about being like in facilitated spaces with Katie. So um, I just want to like say that because it was really, really, really good. Um, the thing that I actually really liked as well, which I've like, um, which I've actually done in like workshop spaces that I've held with small groups is the kind of, um, uh, what's it called? Active listening, kind of getting people to, to really uh, do that uh, outpouring of, of speaking without interruption. And I think that the, there's something, um, there's something extremely valuable about like talking and not being interrupted, but being heard. Um, for like a significant length of time. I don't know if you've done that this, this, uh, this time, but, um, but I find that a really, really valuable exercise. And quite often people, you ask them to say one thing and they say something else. And that's also like extremely enlightening, <laughs> basically, isn't it? Um, and, uh, and the improv as well, like opening up some space to, some space to play. I, I guess that's, um, you know, perhaps that's also part of the, part of the question that I've got um, at the moment about XR's kind of like system designs and understanding creativity and understanding opening space up um, because quite a lot of the work is very like here and um, and I actually spoke to my therapist the other day and she's and she um, told me that she thinks I'm addicted to um, mental activity <laughs> <laughs> and um and uh and and i think she's right um but it's but it's really like um it's really like a disconnected place to be to not be like embodied and not be doing things like uh physically with each other and so um so there was something really like uh, interesting about that improv session that we did uh last year that i really remember like the feeling in the room how 
I don't know how it like affects the people in the space and then what you're capable of at the end of it, which you weren't really able to do at the start. Something. Yeah, we didn't do a full improv this time, but um, Helen led us in a, in a bit of uh, a, a small improv, which then led into processes which were coming from a more creative, non-intellectual place. Claire, I've really, really enjoyed the last hour um, and always impressed when you when you just explain what you're doing with XR. Um, I want everyone, I'm just going to unmute everyone. So let's just, here we go, unmuting you all so we can all say thank you. To yeah, thank you, Claire. 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 Thanks thank for you. what you're doing. Really Bravo. What a gift. <laughs> <laughs> you later, loves. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.